Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Good day, Martin. Are you well? Yes, I have a f uh, frog in the throat, but uh, we'll see if he behaves himself. We'll get him out of there. So we're going to talk about the councils after the Reformation. Because there was some confusion and we didn't clarify the difference between the Council of Trent, the, Count, the Vatican Council One and Vatican Council Two, and Correct. maybe we we messed it up a messed little it bit. Up a so little let's bit fix there. it. Correct. So let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to study Your Word, to study history, and to put it all into perspective. We ask that You bless us and enlighten our minds, and help us through this lecture. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. You see, Martin, we are so involved in, in exactly what is happening and how it all fits together that we have to be very careful to get our his, historicity uh, correctly stated. Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk now about understanding Pope Francis, the post-Reformation councils, to just show that there were various councils and some decrees between councils mm -hmm. very important and uh, how they affect what is happening now what is of course important in all of this is what is the outcome what were the decrees what were the statements what is the end result of all of this and uh, we will be looking at that mm -hmm. but just to set the record straight Let's go to a little bit of history and let's see how we can put the progression in the correct sequence. Yes. But let's start off with a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. This comes from the Great Controversy, page 193. Fearlessly did Luther defend the gospel from the attacks which came from every quarter. The word of God proved itself a weapon mighty in every conflict. With the word he warred against the usurped authority of the Pope and the rationalistic philosophy of the schoolmen. While he stood firm as a rock against the fanaticism that thought to ally itself with the Reformation. Now Martin, this is a very interesting statement. There are three things that are highlighted here. Mm. And he used the word, which was mighty in the conflict, to do these three things. Number one, he used the word to war against the usurped authority of the Pope. Mm. Do we still have to do that today? Yes. We have to use the word... Mm -hmm to war against the usurped authority of the Pope, lest the whole world be swallowed up mm -hmm. in falsities. Correct. And this is one of the reasons why we are so adamant in bringing about or bringing up these series. Yes, to make people aware. Yes. It's not in harmony with the Bible, the way that they usurped authority. Correct. And sweet words and gentle tones steeped in falsehood, contrary to the scripture, are a most dangerous potion. Mm -hmm. So we must use the word to war against usurped authority of the Pope. The second thing he warred again was the rationalistic philosophy of the schoolmen. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very interesting statement because, uh, you know, Christ battled with the scribes and the Pharisees. Yes. And the schoolmen yes. were very adamant about what is written that was never written in the way that they thought it was written or that it meant something else than what they said it meant. Correct. And uh, we have the same thing today, dynamic equivalence. Yes, definitely. Which is... Maybe dynamic, but never equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third thing is he stood firm as a rock against the fanaticism that sought to ally itself with the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Now, fanaticism in those days was something else yes. to what it is today. 
Fanaticism then referred to these emotional experiences that we discussed in our last WhatsApp mm -hmm. that tended to disrupt the order of the church, where uh, the idea was that the spirit is going to guide and the word is not going to be the norm. Yes, yes. So whatever the spirit dictates. And we saw that out of Vatican II, it became very prominent that the spirit was going to be the norm and not the word. word right? yes. But now you have to try and appease Protestantism if you want to bring Protestantism into the fold, right? So you package it in these beautiful words. And this is what we were discussing, mm -hmm. looking at the deception. So those three things, war against the usurped authority of the Pope, war against the rationalistic philosophy of the schoolmen, all of these Greek philosophies mm. that have been incorporated, which are contrary to the scripture, right. and then against this free-for-all, spirit so-called driven phenomenon that sets aside the law of God and the word of God for the experience. Yes. Each of these opposing elements was in its own way setting aside the Holy Scriptures. You see that? Mm -hmm. Each one of them attacks God's Word. Yes. And this is what we have to do. This is our job. Exactly. And, it, and they don't, make, they don't uh, make any bones about it. No. The Reformers never made any bones about no. it. That was their job. And even the Catholic system also don't make any bones about their stance on what the uh, scripture's authority is. They say that they are they above, are above it. it. Absolutely, Finish. absolutely. Each of these opposing elements was in its own way setting aside the holy scriptures, exalting human wisdom as the source of religious truth and knowledge. Rationalism idolizes reason. Now Martin, didn't we discuss reason? Yes and uh, the writings of the Jesuit Gula, who said that reason must inform your faith. Yes. Whereas the Protestant version would be, in my opinion, mm -hmm. your faith must determine your reason. Exactly. So it idolizes reason and makes this the criterion for religion. Romanism, claiming for her sovereign pontiff and inspiration, descended in unbroken line from the apostles and unchangeable throughout all time, gives ample opportunity for every species of extravagance and corruption to be concealed under the sanctity of the apostolic commission. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. So this unbroken line that they refer to from Peter to the present mm. Pope gives them the authority to make null and void even the precepts yes. of Christ. Well, let's put it, their supposed unbroken line of authority. That they, but they claim it to themselves. So like we've seen, it doesn't even hold um, water in the history. Correct. The inspiration claimed by Munzer, now, Münzer was uh, one of the people that brought fanaticism into the Protestant church. He was largely responsible for the peasant revolt as well. And uh, his associates proceeded from no higher source than the vagaries of the imagination. And its influence was subversive of all authority, human or divine. Now, doesn't uh, the Jesuit order teach that the imagination is the one that will control the outcome? Yes, because it comes from the exercises of Loyola. Correct. Imagination. True Christianity receives the word of God as the great treasure house of inspired truth and the test of all inspiration. That is the basis of the battle that is raging in the world today. This is the basis of the battle that has been raging from the time of Adam. Correct. If we do not identify these three features, then we will be swept away in a current that will lead us over the precipice to destruction. Correct. So and that's why we have to speak about all of this. Correct. Otherwise, we are not protesting. Yes. 
And what are we protesting against? Against the obliteration of scripture by means of philosophy and fanaticism in the old sense of the word. Yes, and if you don't illuminate all of this to people, then you will be swept in by even your own denomination that's not Catholic because you won't realize that Correct. they're actually teaching a Catholic doctrine. Correct. Let us just clarify the councils to make it absolutely clear and historically correct. Mm. So the first council to be held after the Reformation was the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was held between 1545 and 1563. It was held in a number of sessions, mm -hmm. and there were sometimes long periods in between sessions. Uh, it was, of course, accepted by the Catholic Church. The previous council had been the Fifth Council of the Lateran, 1512 to 1517. That was prior to the Reformation. The next council after the Council of Trent was the First Vatican Council, which was held more than 300 years later, mm. 1869 to 1870. Now, the Council of Trent was convoked by Paul III. Julius III, who was not Pope at that stage, he was a co-president and he was a cardinal at that stage, and Pius IV. Attendance about 255 during the final session. And the topics were Protestantism and the Counter-Reformation. This is where the great debate took place about the legality of Protestantism, mm. whether it was a movement or whether it was a protest or whether it was a rebellion. Mm. And at the Council of Trent, they decided that it was a rebellion because the Protestants didn't adhere to Sola Scriptura because they accepted Sunday, which was based on the tradition of the church. And that's what the Archbishop of Reggio mm. said in that council. And then finally, as a consequence of that statement, the, the Reformation was condemned okay. as being a rebellion. Good. And all the doctrines, particularly sola scriptura, justification by faith alone, sola Christos, that works had nothing to do with your salvation, thus were rejected by the Council of Trent. They accepted 17 dogmatic decrees covering the then disputed aspects of Catholic religion. So in other words, they confirmed the Catholic position, condemned the Reformation yes. position. That happened at the Council of Trent. Now, how important was the Council of Trent? Now, when we look at uh, Pope Francis, Pope Francis makes many, many statements mm. which appear to be contrary to the Council of Trent. And many conservative Catholics are highly upset because of this. But we need to understand the motive and the game. The Vatican II Council was there to bring the separated children back into the fold of the Roman Catholic Church. And therefore, there had to be a compromise which did not compromise the Catholic position but appeared to compromise yes. it. So we have to look very carefully at wording, for example. Correct. And here is a very interesting clip from Bishop Schneider, who responded to a question on the errors of Luther and the comments of the Pope, which seemed to say that Luther had been correct, which would contradict the Council of Trent, right? And this interplay is very important, so let's just listen to it and then we'll discuss it. Mm. He has a rather heavy German accent, but uh, I'm sure people will understand. Your, Ex Your Excellency, thank you for being here today. My question is, since the discussion is about heresy, one heretic who comes to mind is Martin Luther, whose 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 
uh, the Pope will be commemorating um, in the very, very shortly. Uh, on an airplane interview, the Pope recently said that Martin Luther quote, did not err on the issue of justification. Uh, what is your response to the Lutheran heresy and uh, on the issue of justification and the upcoming ecumenical events and how do traditional Catholics respond to uh, the reports that are coming out? They have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther, the Council of Trent. <laughs> the teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther and the people are infallible ex cathedra. And the comments of the Pope in the plane are not ex cathedra. Well, Martin, that was very clear, wasn't it? Yes. So, what he's saying is the comments of the Pope were not ex cathedra. Yes. Meaning? They were not infallible. Whereas the Council of Trent, those statements were infallible, ex cathedra. They cannot be changed ever. And that's a very important clue. In other words, you can say many things, and you know that the Jesuits have a saying that you can lie if it favors Mother Church. Yes, it is, to further the, if the end justifies the means. The end must justify the means. So this is, this is how they operate. And the fact that they can't change their laws also is seen in the beast in Revelation. That is a combination of all the beasts, all four beasts in Daniel. Correct. And the one is... The Medo-Persians. Correct. And their laws were unchangeable. Correct. They couldn't change it. Yeah. So the, the question of papal infallibility that he mentioned mm. was a given. And uh, they called themselves ultramontanists, the man on the other side of the mountain. Yeah. The Protestants used to use it as a term of mockery. But the papacy changed, turned it into a, a term of endearment. The man, mm. other side the mountain, he was infallible. Yes. But it hadn't been proclaimed as a dogma. Now that's very interesting. So in order to substantiate that the decrees throughout the ages that were based on tradition were unchangeable, they had to be infallible. Correct. So that happened at the next council, yes. which was the first Vatican council. So let's look at this. Because it's very important that we understand yeah. how this conglomerate beast of Revelation chapter 13, with all its components, with the lion component of Babylon in it, with the leopard component of Greece in it, with the bear component of the Medo-Persians mm. in it, that it components applies to all of those criteria. So if we go to the First Vatican Council, apparently this council was interrupted because of war. And uh, the Second Vatican Council is in fact a continuation mm. of a basically uncompleted First Vatican Council. But it nevertheless has a very important historic application because it took place 1869 to 1870. Again, it was the Catholic Church that called it. The previous council had been the Council of Trent. The next council after it would be the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. And the First Vatican Council was convoked by Pope Pius IX, and he was the president and there were 744 attendants. Now the topics are interesting. Rationalism, liberalism, materialism, inspiration of scripture, 
papal infallibility. And the documents are these that came out of it. De Filius and Pastor Aternus. Now, what is fascinating about this council is that the doctrine of papal infallibility mm -hmm. was made a dogma. Yes. Unchangeable. And that referred to all the previous councils as well, mm -hmm. as we heard from Bishop Schneider. It was ex cathedra, infallible, can never be changed. If Protestantism would understand that, they would never be part of an ecumenical council. Correct. Never. So it's always, if, they, if it doesn't look like it, look deeper. Look deeper. Now, this Pope, Pope Pius IX, the First Vatican Council, Latin Concilium Vaticanum Primum, was convoked by Pope Pius IX on the 29th of June 1868 after a period of planning and preparation that began on the 6th of December 1864. Now remember, the Second Vatican Council was also announced in 1959 already, but only took place in 62. Yes. So there was also a period of preparation and planning. Now what is interesting about this particular Pope that called the First Vatican Council is that in 1854, that is before the Council, he had defined as dogma the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, in view of Vatican II, this dogma also became infallible mm. because he proclaimed it, right? right? So we need to look at this Immaculate Conception of Mary. It's a very important dogma. Mm -hmm. And how does it fit into the time that we are living in? Does it belong, Martin, to a previous era of mm. the Roman Catholic Church? Nothing of the Roman Catholic Church belongs to a previous era because they're infallible. So everything comes through and it will never change. It cannot change. So in the spirit of prophecy, we have that statement that she is like the chameleon. Yeah. Maybe I must just clarify. According to them, they're infallible. Yes. <laughs> but this chameleon, it takes on all colors and blends into the background. But blended or not, it's still a chameleon. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so this just sets the record straight on the councils. Now let's just go to Catholic News Agency, the Immaculate Conception. Because so many people believe that this refers to Jesus being immaculate. Mm. But of course it doesn't. It ref refers to Mary being immaculate. And it's very important that we understand yes. these issues. And this is infallible. So in 1854, Pope Pius, this comes from the Catholic News Agency, solemn declaration in a fabulous Deus, clarifies with finality the long-held belief of the church that Mary was conceived free from original sin. Well, there are a number of errors in that statement already because we don't inherit original sin. Because according to the scripture, sin cannot be refer transferred mm -hmm. from one to another. You will have to stand for your own sin. So the sins of the fathers, according to the scripture, cannot be transferred to the children and vice versa. But the Catholics claim that we inherit original sin. We inherit the sin. We don't inherit the sin. We inherit the fallen nature yes. as a consequence of the sin. The propensity to sin. Correct. To sin. Otherwise it would be unfair of God. So in proclaiming the Immaculate Conception of Mary as a dogma of the Church, the Pope expressed precisely and clearly that Mary was conceived free from the stain of original sin. She was immaculate. Martin, let's just stop there. 
What is our weapon? The Bible, right? Yes, the sword. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Bible is absolutely clear that through the blood of the Lamb, we are saved. Mm. It is the sacrifice of Christ that saves us from our sins, right? Correct. Now, it's interesting that in the Catholic Mass, there is a bloodless sacrifice. Mm -hmm. These are all little hints yes. as to how you remove Jesus out of the equation. Not only that, if you are saved only through the blood of the Lamb, then can God declare you immaculate without it? No. 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 What is the condition of of being declared perfect. We've discussed this many times yes. on WhatsApp. You have to have the righteousness of Christ covering you. Uh -huh. And that implies that you have to forsake your sins. Mm -hmm. You have to repent. Yes. And after you have repented, then Christ will forgive your sins. Because of your repentance, you come to Christ and your sins are forgiven and washed away and he covers you with his righteousness. Right? Yes. Now, if Mary was immaculate mm. without that process, and the reason they say it is so, is so that Jesus could be born immaculate without sin. Mm -hmm. In a sense, they're actually saying his immaculate nature, his sinless nature comes yes. from Mary. Could, it, definitely. Now here's my question, Martin. It's been my question from the beginning, seeing that I come from a Catholic background. If God, through his omnipotence, could circumvent his own rules, the wages of sin is death, and declare her immaculate mm. without the blood, then couldn't he have done it for you? Yes. Then what was the point of the cross? There would have been no point. The Immaculate Conception of Mary negates the necessity of the cross because God, by decree, could declare everyone immaculate if he so wished. So let's continue. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the splendor of an entirely unique holiness by which Mary is enriched from the first instant of her conception comes wholly from Christ. She is redeemed in a more exalted fashion by reason of the merits of her son. The Father blessed Mary more than any other created person. In Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and chose her in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. The fathers of the Eastern tradition call the Mother of God the All-Holy, Panagia, and celebrate her as free from any stain of sin, as though fashioned by the Holy Spirit and formed as a new creature. By the grace of God, Mary remained free of every personal sin for her whole life long. Now, Martin, if she is free from all sin, then she could does have she been need, the saviour. Does she need a redeemer? No. She doesn't need a redeemer. But the Bible says she was born under the law. Mm. Which means that she was born under the condemnation of the law. Correct. She was like one of us. Isn't that correct? Definitely. So this dogma bypasses the plan of salvation. Mm. And frees us from the blood of the Lamb. Correct. And you see the problem is if you read through this... It's almost like sugar-coated. So yes. it sounds good. Like we said earlier, if it looks good, look deeper. And that's why you, the way you explained it just now. <laughs> this this is such a travesty of justice. Mm. It's unbelievable. And uh, that is why, if you study further, you will understand why the Catholic view of the atonement is that Christ never died for you. Correct. It wasn't the blood. It was the good works. So this is a very serious issue. 
And Protestants need to understand this. Yes. And remember that it's infallible. So some years ago, Time magazine brought out this uh, cover here. Hail Mary. Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of Jesus. Have they been successful in their endeavor to push this doctrine down the throats of Protestantism? Definitely, yes. Here is an, uh, an article from the National Catholic Reporter, and it says about Pope John Paul II, the Pope may declare Mary co-redemptrix. Special to the National Catholic Reporter, at 77 and in uneven health, John Paul II invests virtually every allocution with some mention of his advancing years and of his devotion to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Before he dies, he may decide to use his charism of infallibility to elevate Mary's crown another tier. So he might declare a co-redemptrix. Now it never happened. Mm -hmm. It never happened. And the reason why I believe it never happened is because this would be a particular nail in the coffin of the ecumenical movement. Because Protestants would... No, then they would... Uh, and now that's a very... In do that again, Martin. <laughs> what did you do? Protestants yeah, would? Uh-uh, no. They'd go, uh-uh, uh, uh. My question is, why do they go along with this nonsense? Hmm? Exactly. <laughs> why do they go along with what has happened so far? Yes. And so he never ever went so far as to proclaim her co-redemptrix. There's an article in the magazine where they say co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces. Mm. So that makes her a co-redeemer and makes her a co-mediator. Now that's fascinating. But the point is, he never went that far. Never used his so-called papal infallibility but but the essence of what he said remained exactly the same and we need to look at that right Correct. so we will look at that here's a little booklet that i have it's a copy so it's not the original and we will we will study it to some extent so that brings us then, Martin, to the Second Vatican Council. And Pope John Paul II was a post-Vatican II Pope. So let's look at the Second Vatican Council and get the dates right. It was from the 11th of October 1962 to the 8th of December 1965. Again, it was the Catholic Church. The previous council had been the First Vatican Council that had declared the Pope infallible, and the same Pope also declared that Mary mm. was immaculate. Correct. Uh, the Second Vatican Council was uh, convoked by Pope John the Twenty-Third. He was also the president, but he died during the council, and Pope Paul the Sixth was the one that completed the council. Uh, there were 2,625 attendees. The topics, complete, unfinished task of Vatican I. And the ecumenical outreach to address the needs of a modern world. And as we discussed in our previous one, this is where Pope Paul VI opted for man mm -hmm. as the center yes. and not God. So man was to have his kingdom here on earth. Yes. Which is, of course, contrary to what Christ says about his kingdom. Yes, we also saw that uh, God has to adapt to the times and not the times to God. Correct. And there were a number of writings that came out of it. We can see a whole host of them over here uh, that came out of the Second Vatican Council. And we are talking about 
Pope Francis as a Second Vatican Council Pope. Correct. Now, Martin, another important point that we mustn't miss is just prior to the Second Vatican Council, Pope Pius XII in 1950, that's 12 years before Vatican II, invoked papal infallibility to define the doctrine of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin in his apostolic constitution, Munificentissimus Deus. Now that's another interesting progression, mm. infallibly, right? And again, they state quite clearly there that he invoked his papal infallibility yes. so that Mary never died. And went to heaven. Now logically, Martin, if she had no sin, and the wages of sin is death, then death doesn't apply to her, right? Correct. So she went to heaven. So the proclamation read, We proclaim and define it to be a dogma revealed by God that the Immaculate Mother of God, Mary Ever Virgin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up bodily and soul into the glory of heaven. Now, Martin, what should this do to Protestants? Let you run. <laughs> it, should, <laughs> it should let you run. I always find it fascinating that if you go to the Middle East, then there are a number of graves of Mary, depending whether you go to the Orthodox sites or whether you go to the Catholic sites. Now, what are they, why are there graves of Mary if she <laughs> never was in one, right? Yes. It just doesn't make any sense. The whole dogma is so ridiculous. But an important point that I want to bring out here is why is it even possible? Mm. Why is it even possible for Protestants to accept yeah. that someone like Mary or any of the other saints can play an important role on the other side of this physical realm. Because they have neglected an important point of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther was absolutely clear that the dead sleep. sleep. And that they will only wake up when? At the resurrection, at the second coming. At the second coming. And it will only be the righteous that's being resurrected at the second coming. Correct. So Martin Luther was very clear on the doctrine of soul sleep. And so were, were the other reformers in England. They were very, very clear. But for some reason, this doctrine which is so clear in the Bible when you study it out, was not included in their catechisms. And the old papal era of immortality of the soul was incorporated. So that opens the way, of yes. course, for accepting any of this nonsense that you can invoke the aid of either Mary or any of the saints. Correct. So now we can see a progression in time, mm. historically, of how these dogmas came about. So if we go to the Vatican webpage to ask them please to define the dogma of the Assumption for us, then it reads as follows. It is in our own age that the privilege of the bodily Assumption into heaven of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, has certainly shone forth more clearly. That privilege has shone forth in new radiance since our predecessor of immortal memory, Pius IX, solemnly proclaimed the dogma of the loving Mother of God's Immaculate Conception. According to the general rule, God does not will to grant to the just the full effect of the victory over death until the end of time has come. And so it is that bodies of even the just are corrupted of the death, and only in the last day will they be joined each to his own glorious soul. Now let's just stop there. Mm -hmm. That is totally unbiblical. Correct. Because if you go 
back to the book of Genesis, then it tells you quite clearly that God took the dust of the ground, mm -hmm. he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Yes. And that living soul is the whole entity. And Martin Luther accepted it as such. These people separate them into two entities to get away with the corruption of the physical so that they can maintain that the non-physical remains alive. Correct. So they continue then. Now God has willed that the Blessed Mary should be exempted from this general rule. She, by an entirely unique privilege, completely overcame sin by her immaculate conception. No need for redemption, Martin. No. And as a result, she was not subject to the law of remaining in corruption of the grave. And she did not have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. Martin, I think they are confused when they say that this is unique, one of a kind. Correct. Because, because isn't Moses in heaven? Mm -hmm. He was resurrected. Yes. But what about Elijah and Enoch? Yeah, they went there without death. Without seeing death. Mm. Now, we've discussed that in previous ones. Yes, we ones. had a bit of a, a word problem there between Elijah and Elijah. So, Martin, sometimes we make mistakes, right? right. It said Elisha, and we read Elisha, and sometimes we said Elijah, mm -hmm. and sometimes we, we were confused. Martin, I think we need more sleep or something like that. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry. I th I'm sure it did come through what we actually meant. Yes. All right. But l let's not make excuses for no. our fallibility. <laughs> 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 but anyway, this is a very fascinating, very fascinating dogma. And this one comes in there just before the Second Vatican Council. I mean, Protestants should be so alarmed. But they're not. And after the Second no. Vatican Council, there they go. No problem. Now, there's a little booklet written by Kevin McNamara. He's the Bishop of Kerry. And it's called Mary, the Mother of God. And it was published in 1982 by the Catholic Truth Society in London. And the subject is Mary, Mother of Jesus Christ, the theology and the theology of the Catholic view of, of this. Now, the one who actually defined it or tried to make it acceptable mm -hmm. to the Protestant world was Pope John Paul II. And this little booklet by the Bishop of Kerry is to show how John Paul II presented the data to the Protestant world so that they could swallow it yes. in tasty little morsels. But of course, he cannot undo any previous infallible dogma, mm. so he has to sail through the quagmire. Mm. Like a serpent. Like a serpent, and try to present it as though it were biblical. And he's the one where they said that he would probably proclaim her as co-redemptrix. Mm -hmm. But after Vatican II, that would be uh, a little bone in the tasty, fishy morsel that might get stuck in the throat of some. So they didn't go that far. But I have the little book here, and it would perhaps be useful if we read some of the things that are written in here because they're all, all based on his speeches and on his writings. So now, Mary, the mother of God, it starts off with that statement. Mary, the mother of God. Uh, is there a problem with that? Yes. I would say there's a problem with that. You yes. can say Mary, the mother of Jesus, right? Correct. Now, the fact of the matter is Jesus is also God, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So... Was she the mother of God or was she the mother of the physical manifestation the physical of Physical manifestation of Jesus. Yes. Who was God. But so God obviously preceded her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th these are all interesting nuances. I'm not going to go through the whole book, but there are some important points here. So there's a little uh, section here called Marian Doctrine Before Vatican II. 
And he writes here, In this period, the role of Mary was keenly studied and devotion to her was fervently practiced throughout the church. I mean, that's a historic fact, right? However, the person of Mary was not always placed in her full and proper context. There was a tendency to extol her privileges without relating them sufficiently to her overall place in God's plan of redemption. While the intention was to honor Mary as much as possible, the effect at times was to make her appear remote from real life. Her glories were highlighted to such an extent that her personal pilgrimage of faith tended to fade into the background. And because of the brilliant light surrounding Mary as queen, the humble virgin of Nazareth was sometimes in danger of being lost to view. See, the problem was the veneration that she received, mm -hmm. which put off the Protestants. Correct. So they had to bring her back to earth a little bit to make her more acceptable without losing the attributes. Yeah. Because there are some infallible dogma dogmas here, right? Mm -hmm. She's immaculate. Unchangeable. Yes. Unchangeable. She didn't see death. She went straight to heaven. Yes. Does it say so in the scripture? No. Nope. So who, who informed us of this? Fortunately, we have a pope, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's so fortunate. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Mary's wonderful privileges, the great things done to her by God, are certainly stressed and lovingly contemplated, but they are always linked by the pope to Mary's God-given role in the history of salvation. Now, there's no doubt that she had a role. She was the mother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But does that give her any role in terms of the plan of salvation, how it was to unfold? No. No. That only God could do. And therefore, Jesus, the Word, became flesh in order to perform that which humanity couldn't do for itself. Nor Mary. No. Mary. Mary's Immaculate Conception. Pope John Paul II's starting point in his treatment of Mary's part in the great plan of salvation is the mystery of her Immaculate Conception. I just read that portion to show that he's bound mm -hmm. by the to the doc dogma of papal infallibility. Yes. Okay. Even further, in fact, at the eternal divine thought and love in which Mary was conceived before, infinitely before, her conception on earth. So in the mind of God, she was already being prepared immaculately for him. And uh, then he quotes the Angelus address where the Pope said these things. And in a striking meditation on the meaning of Advent, the Pope returns to this idea of the eternal origins of Mary in the mind and heart of God. And then lower down it says, it takes place in the time between the fall of the first man and the coming of the Redeemer. The Pope then refers to God's promise to our first parents after the fall. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Martin, it's interesting to me that he quotes the verse correctly. Correctly, yeah. But the Duhay Bible, which is the Jesuit version, says she shall crush your head. But remember, this is a post-Vatican II pope. So he tweaks it. And he puts the correct version in there so as not to alienate the Protestants. You see, we must see how these post-Vatican popes think. Mm -hmm. Always bearing in mind that we're talking about Pope Francis, right? Yes. So what he says on a plane to someone that Martin Luther was not wrong when it came to justification, uh, 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 that's not according to the Council of Trent. And it wasn't ex cathedra. It wasn't infallible. Yeah. It was just a comment. It yeah. means nothing. <laughs> right? That's how it is. Can you see? We need to make this quite clear. 
So if we continue, it says, Christ is always the son of the woman. God's choice of Christ extends ultimately to all his brothers and sisters, but first to Mary. So he's making a point for giving Mary a special elevated position. Yes. He writes here, in bestowing on Mary the privilege of the Immaculate Conception, the Eternal Father had in mind the dignity of his incarnate Son, whose human origins he could not permit to be affected by the least taint of sin. Now Martin, that is astounding. So where did he get his unique sinlessness from? from According his, to this. From his mother. From his mother. And not from his father. Yeah. This sounds a lot like the pagan mythology. It is, in fact, pagan it's mythology. The same. That it's exactly the same. It's like um, Semiramis and Osiris. Correct. She was also immaculately impregnated and gave rise to this immaculate one. So this is pagan philosophy at its, I want, don't want to say best, mm. I want to say at its worst. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to Mary's faith, a little chapter. This is the key to her destiny. The teaching is recalled by the Pope who quotes the statements of the Second Vatican Council that the Virgin Mary at the message of the angel received the word of God in her heart and in her body. So can you see that the Second Vatican Council is being used to smooth yes. the way? Mm -hmm. Without getting rid of the dogmas. Exactly. Without admitting to a mistake. Yes, but because it still points out that it was infallible previously. Correct. And then there is this prayer of the Pope. This is the prayer to the Virgin, Altötting, in 1980. Let us listen to the Pope as he expresses these eternal doctrines about Mary. Quote, with the whole church, I profess and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man for his incarnation brought to Adam's sons who are subjected to the power of sin and death, redemption and justification. At the same time, I am deeply convinced that no one has been called to participate so deeply as you, the mother of the Redeemer, in this immense and extraordinary mystery. And then he continues with the chapter, Mary, the spiritual mother of mankind. She is the spiritual mother of mankind. Now, this becomes very interesting. So, the mystery of the redemption took shape, the Pope declares, quote, beneath the heart of the Virgin of Nazareth when she proclaimed her fiat, in inverted commas. Now, we must understand this word fiat. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Because Pope Francis drove in a little fiat when he came to the United States and everybody referred to his humility. In actual fact, it was a statement of arrogance. Mm -hmm. Because the word fiat means formal authorization. It's a decree. So if you have a fiat decree, it cannot be moved. It's a law of Medes and, and Persians. Persians. It's infallible. It's the paws of the bear, right? So this is all very interesting. So there are certain things there which are fiat, which are decrees. If We read a little further. It says, they understand the word spoken from the cross as addressed to each of them. Spiritual motherhood knows no limits. So when Jesus said, Behold your mother, mm. he was not speaking to John the disciple alone. He was speaking to all of humanity. Mm. So she became the mother of humanity there. The Bible knows nothing of this. Eve was the mother of humanity. But Eve wasn't the spiritual mother of humanity either. No, no. Nobody is the spiritual mother of, of no. anybody. No. no, you can have examples of 
of fine spirituality, and Mary was one of them. We're not running down Mary. No. We're running down papal encyclicals which are contrary to Scripture. So three moments are highlighted in this account of the spiritual motherhood of Mary. The moment when she conceived the son of Nazareth, the words of Jesus to Mary and John at Calvary, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Now it gets interesting. In response to the prayers of Mary and the disciples, Mary becomes first the mother of Jesus, physically, but also spiritually. That is, by welcoming it into her heart in faith. At the foot of the cross, she becomes the spiritual mother of all men, represented there by St. John. And at Pentecost, she becomes specifically mother of the church which at that moment is fully born and sent into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Martin, it's fascinating to me how they expand on this topic. Because at one stage there was an article in a German magazine where it stated that John Paul II was not averse to the idea mm. of Mary being somehow part of the Trinity. And then there is this idea that the Holy Spirit is feminine. And maybe she's associated with that role. Now, they didn't go that far, but in any case, this, this issue with the Holy Spirit. So if we read further, And just as Mary, the praying virgin of Nazareth, the virgin of faith and trust in God, has been the active instrument of the Holy Spirit in the incarnation of the divine Redeemer, so now, in the cynical, the Holy Spirit uses her prayer, her holy receptive faith, to bring the church finally into being. Thus, Mary continues the maternal role she had begun at the moment of the incarnation. So, Martin, who is the medium through whom the Holy Spirit now works? Mary. Mary. So, and her, if her prayers are used, then that part of the sanctuary where the incense goes up and that prayers is not Jesus's anymore, no, now it's Mary's. It's Mary. Now we'll get into that a little bit later because we discussed in the previous one, and this gets rather complicated, that the charismatic movement, mm. which is based on the Holy Spirit, is thus, according to this philosophy, a movement of Mary. Now, yeah. in a sense, Mary is the negation of what God has said. Because God said, the wages of sin is death. Mm. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of yes. God. There's no one righteous. No, not one. Mary was born under the law. In other words, under the condemnation of the law. She is as much in need of redemption as anyone else. Yes. We see that the papacy has negated all of them mm -hmm. and made her the medium of the Holy Spirit. Now, question. When the Bible says that the end time Babylon will be a hold of every foul and detestable bird, mm. A bird is a symbol of the Holy Spirit when it is a clean bird, the dove. So an unclean bird is an unclean spirit. Isn't this the manifestation of the devil? Mm -hmm. Now, interesting. Yes, because that's, like you said, we will be discuss this, but this pertains to Protestants. Yes. Now, when he talks about Mary at the foot of the cross, it says, it is worth noting that the Pope in this, as in his Marian teaching, faithfully following Vatican II, avoids completely the use of the term co-redemptrix. <laughs> it says so in this book. So that's why the, he's avoiding it, but the thought is there. He's, he's invoking it. He is. And implying it, but not using the word. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. 
So he didn't go and sit on his papal chair and declare it infallibly because that would have damaged the ecumenical movement. But in his teaching, he's teaching it. Okay, very interesting. He's careful to keep clear of any terminology that might in the least be open to the inference that Mary contributed anything to the work of redemption that did not already depend on Christ's saving sacrifice. So they are sneakily circumventing it. So let's look at this chapter on the mother of the church. He recalls the teaching of the Second Vatican Council on Mary's spiritual motherhood and speaks of the church's great debt to the council for the manner in which it placed this teaching in a new and clearer light. Can you see how important these councils were? Yes. The Pope also, on more than one occasion, recalls the solemn invocation of Mary by Pope Paul VI under the title Mother of the Church. So now she's the mother of the church, she's the mother of everyone. Now if she's the mother of everyone, then everyone belongs to the church. Mm -hmm. That means all the separated children must come together. And that's exactly what Pope uh, Benedict said. Isn't it, it all comes together. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that you get this terminology in Revelation? Correct. The mother of harlots. The mother of so harlots. It's, and that's the mother of fallen churches. Correct. So, if we continue, Pope John Paul the fact, in fact, asks everything from Mary. There is no genuine need of the church or of mankind that lies outside of her interest. Mary, he declares, is always at the very center of our prayers. She is the first amongst those who ask. She is omnipotentia suplex the omnipotence of intercession. Martha, okay. she's the omnipotence of intercession. Hasn't he just thereby negated what he said previously? All right, he continues to describe that. He says, to describe Mary in these terms may appear exaggerated at first sight. What must be noted, however, is that the sphere of Mary's omnipotence, in adverted commas, is precisely that of intercession. She is the unfailing efficacy with her divine son of her mother's prayer. So basically she's, the, she's a co-redeemer and she is a co-advocate. These are all titles that have been suggested that she is advocate for the people of God, which again robs Jesus of his position. Yes. Then he talks about the genius of the mother. I remember that Mother Teresa said, no Mary, no Jesus. Sure. Yeah. That's fascinating. That sums <laughs> it up completely, exactly. right? In actual fact, I always wanted to remind Mother Teresa that it should be turned round without Jesus, no Mary, Mary. because he created her in the first place, yes. right? Okay. So the Second Vatican Council, that Mary occupies a place in the church which is the highest after Christ and also closest to us, and he quotes Lumen Gentium, page 53. This does not mean, it should be stressed, th that we must think of Christ as remote. In contrast to Mary who is near, Mary is herself part of the mystery of Christ and his redemption. In her, Christ is present as the son of the woman. There is no Christ separated from her. Sure. Now, this becomes a dogma which is absolutely amazing. Now, Martin, if you had to take yourself and you would have to promulgate a doctrine like this in relation to your mother, whether you were now a good man or an evil man, just hypothetically, 
is your mother intimately involved in every good or evil decision that you make in your life? No. No. She may have laid the groundwork yeah. in your upbringing, but, but she is not the one that actually performs yeah, these Yeah, and makes issues. the decision. Yeah. But here it yeah. seems as if Jesus... He couldn't choose anything if it weren't for his mother. Correct. That's why. In many Roman Catholic circles, they come to the conclusion that nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. But nobody comes to Jesus except through Mary. Mm. Now you have a problem. Because you have another mediator between the two. And there are literally hundreds of papal statements and Catholic father statements which elevate Mary to that position. And none of what I'm reading here negates it in any shape mm. or form. Repeatedly the Pope affirms that the genius of the mother is the genius of the heart. A mother, he says, is a heart personified and this genius is expressed in love. That is why Mary as mother is called to lead everyone to the Redeemer to bear witness to him even without words, only with love, in which the genius of the heart is expressed. Everyone is led to God through Mary. Is that scriptural, Martin? No, not at all. So we are reading here about post-Vatican II thinking of Mary. And the Protestant world is saying, that the Roman Catholic Church has changed. Yeah. Here's another plan of redemption. This one to me, this little chapter to me is fascinating. We don't have to go through it all, but uh, let's just look at this one still. She's the ideal image of the Church. As well as being mother of the Church, Mary is its type or archetype. The ideal image, its ideal image. This has been highlighted by the Second Vatican Council. Can you see where the council yeah. comes in all the time? Exactly. Not negating anything, Nothing. highlighting it actually. Right. <coughs> it is also the teaching of Pope John Paul II. Just as every mother, he remarks, transmits her own resemblance to her children, so there is a deep resemblance between Mary and the church. A little further he says, Mary is therefore the first fruit and the most perfect image of the church. Martin, whose image are we created in? God. Whose image should we reflect? Jesus. Who are they reflecting? Uh, Mary. Mary. Mm. So, the level that you have to reach goes no higher than man. Yeah, correct. He has opted for man, man in his entirety. And by using and invoking Mary in this fashion, man becomes his own redeemer. And the blood of the Lamb is negated. Mm. This is a very serious doctrine. She is the archetype or prototype of the glorified church in the future. Martin, this takes away the position of Christ. This negates it. If Protestants would read this, they would understand why the world is heading where it is heading. Now, listen to this statement over here. In fact, the Pope affirms both Mary and the Church are rightly said to beget and fashion Christ here on earth. Can I read that again? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the Pope affirms both Mary and the Church are rightly said to beget and fashion Christ here on earth. Mary gave the Lord to the world realizing the type of the church in herself for the first time, and the church in her turn, following Mary, continues to manifest him to the world, to mold him in the hearts of men. 
Martin, this is a very serious yeah. issue. I no, don't no, think they elevate her so high that it's almost as if Jesus is a little bit less. Absolutely. Without him, we can do nothing. Let's jump to the final chapter because I've really had quite enough of this by now. <laughs> it says, Mary, the mother of unity. Mm. Okay. Uh, Lord Jesus says, come out and be separate, right? Mm -hmm. It may be felt that the very comprehensive role assigned by the Pope to Mary in the history of salvation and in the life and mission of the church may create difficulties in the path to Christian unity mm. for large numbers of our fellow Christians. And it should. Yes. <laughs> there is no doubt a challenge here for ecumenism. Mm -hmm. They realize that they're putting it in writing. <laughs> they're not even sugarcoating or hiding this. No. Take it or leave it, Protestant brethren. <laughs> Shape up or ship out, right? Yeah. This is amazing. Then it says here, who must devote more attention to the role of Mary than for one reason or another it has hitherto received? Certainly, the strongly biblical quality of the Pope's Marian doctrine and devotion and his emphasis on Mary's total dependence on Christ should make it easier for Christians of the Reformation tradition to meet him on the common ground. So he quoted a Bible verse correctly, uh, then, <laughs> and then violated its principles and says, but you know what? He did say to John, behold your mother, what's your problem? Huh? As far as the Pope himself is concerned, there is no doubt that whatever difficulties for ecumenism he may perceive in the Church's Marian doctrine, at least in the short term, these could not, in his view, justify any minimizing of Mary's role as made known in Scripture and as understood by the tradition of the Church. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. We have not changed. Our doctrines are infallible. We will not move in our position on Mary. We will sugarcoat it so that uh, you may come on board, but accept it or face the consequences. And that's what they said. That's what they are saying. So having said that, let's move on. There were some issues with... Uh, are quoting Thomas Aquinas. And uh, I said at one stage that he was quoted in many papal encyclicals, including Rerum Novarum. Mm. And uh, being in these encyclicals and being part of this process that came post-Vatican II, of course, Thomas Aquinas lived way back. We remember that Thomas Aquinas was quoted in papal encyclicals such as Rerum Novarum. And uh, we have to see where this actually leads to, because this is important. Yes, we've got some examples of where does it, it, it uh, materializing in our day. Correct. So let's look at the statement again. He wrote, because the goods of some are due to others by natural law, there is no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. Now, we must still get to this issue of natural law. I yes. think we'll discuss that in the next one. So Thomas wrote, in cases of need, all things are common property, so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's property, for need has made it common. Mm. So Martin, if you want to implement Catholic social teaching, where everybody becomes equal, where, as Klaus Schwab says, you possess nothing and are happy and you receive a social grant from the government on a monthly basis so that everybody is equal, then need should not become a factor, right? Yes, correct. But seeing that need is, is a factor, factor today, mm. we have to demonstrate to the world what the consequences of the divide between rich and poor really are. We need to level these playing fields. Isn't that the doctrine of social teaching? Yes. 
It's just look where this leads to. Here we have a video clip of what's happening in society today. And there were some discussions as well on the various news outlets of the world. So let's just look at this one. Seventeen Walgreens, Councilman, pulling out of the Bay Area because they can't make any money because you, you can walk in and steal whatever you want and it's no longer a crime. So Walgreens is like, we're out. Prosecutors in San Francisco and in many other places throughout the state of California, for example, but not just there, no longer charge shoplifters. So people steal whatever they want. The store is closing due to what local reports are calling a spree of rampant shoplifting. And look at this. Just 15 minutes after an Inside Edition crew showed up at the drugstore, we found this guy jumping over the front counter, taking an airbed, and leaving the store on his scooter. No questions asked, no one stopping him. He just came in with a suitcase. That's crazy, dog. Every day. They just come in with suitcases? Yeah. I don't care. Call 911. To be clear, it's not that Americans have become more prone to steal, it's that stealing is now allowed. And when you allow something, you get more of it. Martin, let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. We know what the social teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is. Mm -hmm. And we know what the learned doctors have contributed in terms of this doctrine, yes, right? Yes, like Thomas Aquinas. Now, this is a very clever way of bringing about that system which they ultimately want. This is a Hegelian dialectic. You first allow the divide between rich and poor to become ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So that someone like Bill Gates or any one of these possess billions and the others possess nothing. And then you allow the social tensions to take place. And this is not a racial issue. This no. covers the economic field irrespective of what race you are part of. And then you have this tremendous tension. And then eventually you, you get to the point where need has made all things common mm -hmm. and you allow stealing and that upsets people right correct and some people get very upset especially when it happens in the privacy of your own home mm -hmm. or perhaps at the point of a gun yeah and uh what is the solution to this let's stop this great divide and equalize it mm -hmm then we will have removed this problem. So you create the problem. Yes. And then you produce the solution for the problem. And then you have complete control. Correct. Over every single aspect. 
And this is where Roman Catholicism is leading the world by the nose. Yes. Because people are so involved in this crisis because everybody is touched by it. It seems that the only way out is to follow their way. Correct. So Martin, if we want to address all of these issues, then uh, we need a time of trouble, right? Yeah. And the Bible says, and it's interesting that the, the heading topic in the King James says the time of the end. Yeah. Daniel 12, verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And we've discussed this verse before. Mm -hmm. When he stands up, that's the close of probation. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So Martin, if you want crime to increase, then defund the police. Correct. And let us get this period of turmoil so that we can introduce the legislation that we want. And before we do that, let's just put some controls in place that we can control exactly who is allowed to buy and sell. Yes. And also important to remember what we've shown, where does it come from? It comes from Rome. It comes from Rome. So everything that you see that's happening in the world is the beast system running it. Correct. And there are so many people that want to put the blame on someone else. Exactly. It's either a racial problem, or it's a Zionist problem, or, or it, it is a this Demi problem. Democrat or a republic problem. Or a political problem. It's not. It's a Roman problem. Yes. And if we don't realize this, and if we do not find our source of salvation at the right source, then we will be swept away in this current, in a time of trouble that's as, such as never was. May God give us the wisdom to make this book the standard and not philosophies and traditions which are based on pagan philosophies and pagan religions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to understand that we are dealing with an enemy that uses the word of God. When you were tempted, Lord Jesus, there in the wilderness of temptation, the devil came with the word of God and you counted with, it is written. Let us also counter with it is written. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.